the Plymouth Colony Saga told by the women who lived it, by the Central Texas Mayflower Colony of the Texas Society of Mayflower Descendants. Videos in the series include the wives of colony leaders, Alice Carpenter Southworth Bradford, wife of Edward Southworth and Governor William Bradford, Susanna Jackson White Winslow, wife of William White and Edward Winslow in two parts, and Mary Brewster, wife of William Brewster. Wives of prominent couples, Elizabeth Tilly Howland, wife of John Howland, Priscilla Mullen Alden, wife of John Alden, Sarah Warren Cook, wife of John Cook, and Elizabeth Fisher Hopkins, wife of Stephen Hopkins. Introducing Elizabeth Fisher Hopkins, presented by Betty Prince. Descended of Pilgrim William Bradford, Pilgrim Richard Warren, Pilgrim Francis Cook, and Pilgrim John Cook. Good day. I am Elizabeth Fisher Hopkins. I lived a simple life, quietly cooking, cleaning, and caring for others when I lived in London. My life changed when I met an adventurous man named Stephen Hopkins. I first met Stephen in 1615. At the time, he was grieving while he tried to rebuild his life. Six years before, he had left his wife and two children to help settle the new world. When he learned of her death, he had returned to England to care for their two children, Constance and Giles. Little by little, Stephen began to share his story with me. In 1609, while married to his first wife, Mary, he became a clerk for Pastor Richard Buck and traveled with him on the ship, the Sea Venture, toward Jamestown in the New World. He signed a three-year term as an indentured servant to the Virginia Company, thinking he could make enough money to provide support for his family for many years to come. The Sea Venture traveled with a fleet of ships, but they got separated from the others during a violent storm. The new Jamestown governor, Sir Thomas Gates, was also on this ship. The Sea Venture shipwrecked on the Isle of Devils, also called Bermuda. Stephen told me how frightening it was and how they had to survive for 10 months living only on wildlife. Sitting around the fireplace one evening, Stephen explained to me why he had felt it necessary to be part of an organized mutiny against Governor Gates. It was frightening to learn he had then been sentenced to death. He said he had to beg for mercy on behalf of his wife and children back in England. Thankfully, his life was spared. When Stephen paused, I waited quietly and watched tears filled in his eyes. He finally cleared his throat and went on to explain how the men who were involved in the mutiny had built two ships in order to leave the island. He was on the ship called Deliverance, which was able to sail to Jamestown. When they arrived in Jamestown, they found the colonist situation was desperate. No one had planted a garden, their food supply was nearly gone, and they had so alienated the native people that they were afraid to leave the fort to hunt for food. Stephen said he was so concerned about the situation. He stayed at Jamestown to help until September of 1614. During that time, he got to know the Native Americans and learned some of their language. When he got the news that his wife Mary had died months before, he returned to England and assumed care of his children. As I spent more time with Stephen, I began to love and admire his adventuresome and fun-loving ways. More and more, he helped remove my shyness and taught me to laugh. We were married two years later and had a daughter named Damaris the next year. Stephen worked hard as a tanner and a merchant, but times continued to be difficult. With his background in the New World, 
1620, the Company of Merchant Adventurers in London asked him to assist with their venture in helping a group of pilgrims settle in Virginia. He would be the only passenger on the Mayflower with prior New World experience. Even though I was pregnant and we had three other children to care for, we decided there would be more opportunities in the New World and it would be worth the inconvenience of the ocean voyage and setting up a new home in a foreign land. When it was time to depart London, we met the pilgrim separatists who would be our fellow passengers. They seemed to be nice people, but they were extremely serious and had what I thought were a lot of extra rules to follow in order to please God. We were all concerned when the Mayflower turned back to London because of the, the accompanying ship, which was called the Speedwell, had sprung a leak. As my pregnancy advanced, I wondered if we would reach land before I delivered. I knew the other women on the ship would help when it was time for my baby to arrive, however. It was a rough voyage, and during a brutal storm at sea, our son Oceanus was born. He was a happy baby and lived for seven years before he died of a disease. Since the Mayflower had been blown off course and winter was upon us, the ship's captain decided it was too dangerous to attempt to get to Virginia, and we decided to dock at Cape Cod Harbor. Before disembarking, Stephen was one of the 41 men who signed the Mayflower Compact, pledging that they would obey the laws of the colony as they were established. Stephen played an active role among the colonists when they arrived in Cape Cod. He went on early exp explorations in search of the best place to establish a colony. Uh, Stephen hosted a native called Salmoset for a night when the natives visited the new plantation in the spring of 1621. When the Wampog leader, Masayot, called in the English to work out a treaty, Stephen offered our home as a meeting place for the negotiations. He later accompanied other Englishmen on trips to visit the Wampog people. After our house was completed, Stephen built a simple tavern on Leiden Street in Plymouth. It became a favorite place for many of the colonists, but it often got into trouble with the pilgrim courts. His intention was to try to make people happy after they had worked hard in the fields. Stephen was brought before the Plymouth authorities for such things as selling alcohol and letting people play shuffleboard on the Lord's Day, and for letting people drink too much on his property. He was fined twice for selling beer for twice its value. He even got fined for selling a looking glass for double its value in the Bay Colony. One time he got into a fight and seriously wounded a fe fellow colonist. In spite of these things, his knowledge of the New World was so valuable that he continued as an assistant to Governor Bradford until 1636. Stephen and I had a lot of friends and a wonderful family. After we landed in Plymouth, we had more children. Sadly, both Damaris and Oceanus died as children. The entire family was overwhelmed with grief. When Damaris died, we gave our next daughter the same name. Our first Damaris had been such a sweet child that we thought we would be able to continue with her memory. Uh, we didn't want it to die. Our remaining children left a proud legacy of adventure, service, and enjoyment of life. Without Stephen's knowledge of the language and the customs of the native Indians, Plymouth Colony might not have survived. Elizabeth Fisher Hopkins reenactor, Betty Prince. Technical production, Ann Bell. Background music, Betty Prince.